Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on advanced electrolysis. And in this video, we're also going to be looking at the core practical for this topic. Now, before you watch this, make sure you are comfortable and confident with how ions are formed, um, ionic bonding, how we can extract metals from their ores, and the previous video on the basics of electrolysis. Now, in this video, we're going to quickly recap electrolysis, then we'll look at redox reactions and how that relates to electrolysis. Then we'll look at um, the electrolysis core practical. And finally, we'll look at how we can purify copper using electrolysis. Okay, so let's recap the basics of electrolysis. Now, electrolysis is breaking down ionic compounds into their elements using direct um, electrical current. Direct current, member is electrical current that always flows in one continuous direction around a circuit, unlike oscillating current, uh, which flows around the circuit, but changes direction many times each second. Now, in order for electrolysis to happen, we need an electrolytic cell, which looks like this. So this is our electrolytic cell. And there are a few different components in our electrolytic cell. The first thing is we have an electrolyte. That is our molten or dissolved ionic compound. And it needs to be molten or dissolved so that the ions are free to move and conduct electricity. The second thing we need is an electrode. So we need the cathode. That is our negative electrode. Remember, the electrodes are made of a conductive material that conducts the electrical current into the electrolyte. So here is our negative electrode, our cathode here. And you can see it's attached to the negative terminal. And equally, we need an anode, which is our positive electrode. Um, and again, that's, that's completing the circuit, and both those electrodes are carrying that current into the electrolyte. Now, in terms of predicting the products of electrolysis, with molten ionic compounds, it's really straightforward. Always at the cathode, we will see a metal being formed, and at the anode, we will see a non-metal being formed. Whereas with aqueous ionic compounds that means a solution it gets more complicated and the reason why is because water can do this water can split up into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions and so in an aqueous solution those ions can get involved and they can be discharged instead of the ionic compound so what we see is that at the cathode with an aqueous solution if the metal in our ionic compound is more reactive than hydrogen, we'll see that the hydrogen gets discharged instead of the metal. If the metal is less reactive than hydrogen, then we will get that metal. And similarly, at the anode, um, we'll normally get the non-metal being formed unless the um, ionic compound is a sulfate or a nitrate salt, in which case what happens is we'll see oxygen being formed. OK, so now we've recapped electrolysis, we're going to get stuck into some higher tier material, which is where we explore electrolysis reactions in terms of them also being redox reactions. Now, to recap some stuff from previous presentations, um, redox, a redox reaction is one where reduction and oxidation take place at the same time. And in terms of electrons, we use the oil rig mnemonic to help us understand that. So oil means oxidation is loss of electrons and the rig is reduction is gain of electrons so let's see how that applies to electrolysis now at the anode remember the anode is our positive electrode the anode attracts anions which are negative and when the anions reach the anode they become discharged by losing electrons and if you lose electrons that you means you've been oxidized so the anode is where the oxidation in our redox reaction takes place. Equally, the cathode is our negative electrode and our positive metal ions, our cations, they are attracted to the cathode and they get discharged by gaining electrons. And gaining, according to oil rig, reduction is gain. So by gaining electrons, they are being reduced. So we can summarize this with a little mnemonic um, which is this, anox and care. Anox mean, stands for at the anode, oxidation takes place. And the care part is at the cathode, reduction takes place. 
So let's have a look at a couple of examples to see how this actually works out with some real um, electrolysis examples. And what you need to be able to do in these examples is for any given kind of molten or aqueous electrolyte, you need to be able to produce some half equations to describe what's happening at the anode and what's happening at the cathode. So let's get stuck in. Now, our first example is going to be the electrolysis of molten lead bromide, which is PBBr2. Now, because bromine is in group 7, we can be confident in working out that the bromide ions are Br- minus because the atoms will need to gain one electron to complete their outer shells. And from that, we can work out that if there are two Br- minus ions, then the lead ions must be Pb2+. Plus. Now, we know that our cations, our positive ions, will go to the cathode. So we can do that half equation first. So the first thing we're going to do is write Pb2+. Plus, okay? And we're at the cathode. So we've seen already the care uh, mnemonic there. At the cathode, reduction takes place. So to show reduction, to show something gaining electrons, we're going to add 2 E minus like that. And what's that going to form? That is going to form PB like that, just on its own. And that is our first half equation done. And that is a reduction because it's gaining electrons. And with a reduction, we always show those electrons being added on the left of our half equation. So what about at the anode? Well, our anions, our bromides, they're going to go to the anode. So let's start by writing Br minus. Now at the anode, oxidation takes place. That's the anox part of our mnemonic. And so how do we show oxidation? Well, what we do is, is this. We want to show the bromide losing electrons. And the way to show that is to draw our arrow, put a bromine atom rather than, I rather than an ion, and then place our electron here. That electron is next to the bromine because it's been removed from the bromine. Now, in a GCC exam, this will normally get you the full marks, but it's perhaps more correct to recognise that our bromine won't just be Br, it will actually be Br2. So we should balance the equation by showing that there are two bromide ions becoming one bromine molecule and two electrons like that. OK, so let's look at some more examples. Now, our second example is going to be the electrolysis of molten aluminium oxide, Al2O3. Um, now, let's think about our ions first of all. So we should know that because oxygen is in group six, it's got six electrons. So the oxide ion will be O2 minus because oxygens will gain two electrons to form a two minus ion and complete the outer shells. OK, three of those will give us a total of six minus charges. So we can work out from that then that our two aluminiums will each be three plus um, Al3 plus to give us six positive charges as well. So let's then look at what happens at the anode and the cathode. So remember cations, in this case, our aluminium three plus go to the cathode because the cathode is negative. So we can write Al3 plus first of all. And if we think back to our little our little mnemonic, um, anox and care, so at the cathode, reduction happens. So reduction is gaining electrons, so let's show that. Now aluminium is aluminium 3 plus, it's going to need to gain three negative electrons in order to become a neutral atom. So we can write that like that, three, uh, Al3 plus plus three electrons with an arrow just making regular old aluminium on its own like that. And that's a reduction, and we always show reductions by putting the electrons on the left, showing they're being gained by the ion. And then for our anode, well, at the anode, um, we have anox, that means oxidation is taking place. And it is our anions, our oxide O2 minus ions, they will go to the anode. And that will look like this. So we're going to have O2 minus here. Now, we're seeing an oxidation taking place. So with an oxidation, you show the electrons being broken off uh, and appearing on the right of the equation. So we're going to have O, like this, our oxygen atoms. And this time, rather than just a single electron, because it's an O2 minus ion, we're going to lose two electrons. And we'll write them like that. So there's our two electrons that have broken off. Now, again, 
in the context of a GCSE uh, exam question, often you'll get full marks just for writing that. But to be more correct, we need to recognise that oxygen doesn't exist as oxygen atoms, but as O2 molecules. So in which case we'd have two oxide ions making one O2 and four electrons like that. What about example three? A bit more difficult this time because this one is the electrolysis of aqueous copper chloride. So in addition to our CuCl2, we also need to consider that we're going to have some hydrogen plus ions and some hydroxide OH minus ions present as a result of the water in that aqueous solution. Now, um, the copper chloride is lending us Cl minus ions for the chloride and Cu2 plus ions for the copper. Now, in terms of what's happening at the cathode, uh, if the copper was more reactive than hydrogen, we would think about the hydrogen becoming discharged, but it's not. So we'll just stick with our copper. So remember, cations go to the cathode. So at the cathode, we're going to have Cu2 plus. Remember, at the cathode, we have care, cathode, reduction. So reduction is gaining electrons. Our copper 2 plus will gain those two electrons like this. And it's two electrons because it's a 2 plus charge. And that will form a neutral copper atom, just like that. OK. And what about our anions? So our chloride anions, anions will go to the anode. Um, so we can write those over here. And at the anode, we have anox, that is anode, oxidation. So the chlorine, the chloride ion is going to lose that electron. And we show oxidation by putting the electrons on the right of the equation. So the Cl minus will form a Cl and an electron. And again, for the sake of completeness, we should recognise that the chlorine is not an atom, but actually a Cl2 molecule. So we need two chloride ions and two electrons like that. OK, so let's look at two last examples. The first one is the electrolysis of aqueous sodium iodide, NaI. Now, sodium iodide is made up of Na plus ions. That's because sodium is in group one. It has one electron in its outer shell, and it will lose that to form a single positive ion. And then iodine. Iodine is in group seven. So it has seven electrons in the outer shell, and it will gain one to form a single negative ion like that, I minus, which we call iodide. Now, also because this is aqueous um, solution, we also have the H plus ions and the hydroxide OH minus ions from that breakdown of water into its ions. So let's think about what will happen at the cathode first of all. Now, remember, remember we've got the mnemonic care for the cathode. At the cathode, we see reduction taking place and reduction is the gain of electrons. So what will be reduced? What will gain electrons? The H plus or the Na plus? Now, sodium is more reactive than hydrogen, so it will not get reduced. And instead, what will happen is the hydrogen ions will get reduced. And that looks like this. So we have H plus gaining that electron E minus to form a hydrogen atom. But hydrogen doesn't exist as just atoms. It exists as H2 molecules. So for completion, we write H2 and that will require two hydrogen ions and therefore two electrons to reduce those ions. Now, what about at the anode? Remember, we have our other mnemonic, anox, for the anode. That means anode oxidation. So again, what's going to get oxidized this time? Is it the hydroxide or is it the iodide? Now, hydroxide is more stable than the iodide. Remember, it's only sulfate and nitrate that we need to worry about. It's not one of those things. So hydroxide will not get oxidized and instead the iodide will. And that will look like this. So the iodide, I minus, will become iodine plus the electron that it's just lost. But remember, iodine forms I2 molecules like that. So we will have two iodides making I2 and two electrons. OK, and our next example, last, last, last one is um, example five, which is the electrolysis of aqueous, again, potassium bromide, KBr. Now, for similar reasons to before, potassium is in group one, so it will form a K plus ion as it loses its one outer shell electron. And bromine is in group seven, so it will form a bromide ion as it gains one more electron 
to complete its outer shell. But also, because we're aqueous, we've got the H plus ions and the hydroxide ions from that water. So what is going to get um, oxidized and reduced? Well, at the cathode, remember we've got care, so cathode reduction. So what's going to be reduced at the cathode? Is it the H plus or the K plus? Again, a bit like with the sodium example above, potassium is more reactive than hydrogen, so it will not get um, reduced. Instead, the H plus will get reduced. So we'll see H plus gaining an electron to form hydrogen, but it's actually H2 molecules. So two H pluses will gain two electrons to form H2. And then we've got the oxidation, remember anox taking place at the anode. So again, what's going to get oxidized this time? Will it be the hydroxide or the bromide? Now, bromide is less stable than hydroxide, so it will get oxidized and the hydroxide will not. And that will look like this. We'll have bromide forming a bromine atom and the electron that it's just lost. But remember again, bromine doesn't exist as individual atoms. It exists as Br2 molecules. So we'll have two Br minuses making Br2 and two electrons. OK, so now we're back onto the foundation tier material where we look at the core practical. And part one of that was the electrolysis of aqueous copper sulfate with inert electrodes. Um, now, the aim of this was simply to observe the electrolysis of copper sulfate solution using these inert graphite uh, electrodes. Now, inert simply means that the electrodes do not take part in any kind of chemical reaction. They're just carrying the current into the electrolyte, but they're not getting uh, involved any further than that. Now, our setup was really straightforward. We set up the um, electrolytic cell, like the diagram shown on the right here. So we've got a few different things. We've got our graphite anode, our positive electrode, and our graphite cathode, our negative electrode. We've got our direct current electrical supply, and we've got our copper sulfate solution as our electrolyte. Okay, And all we did then was we switched on the power supply, and we just observed what happens. And when we did that, we saw two things. First of all, at the cathode, we saw a layer of um, orangey brown copper metal being formed as copper ions are discharged and turned into atoms of copper metal. And you can see that here. You can see here a copper ion being attracted towards that negative um, cathode and being turned into this layer of copper atoms that builds up on our cathode. At the anode, it's a little bit more complicated. So for our anode, we have to remember that water, when it uh, is in electrolysis, naturally breaks down in, 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 in tiny amounts into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. And what we see is that in the electrolysis of copper sulfate, those hydroxide ions get discharged rather than the sulfate. So we've got these sulfate ions. They don't get discharged because they are more stable than the hydroxide ions. And it's the hydroxide ions that go to the anode and they get discharged. And we see these bubbles of oxygen gas. And you can see when you, as soon as you switch this on, the anode just starts fizzing away as all those bubbles of oxygen gas are formed and bubble to the surface. Now, part two of the core practical um, was to study the electrolysis of copper sulfate, um, of aqueous copper sulfate, using copper electrodes. Now, these are not inert. These do take part, and that's what we'll see in just a second. Now, our aim here wasn't just to observe. It was to investigate the effect of changing the current on the rate of electrolysis. And it worked something like this. So our method, first of all, was that we cleaned two copper electrodes with sandpaper. That's to remove any kind of impurities from their surface. And then we weighed them and we recorded the mass of each of them, um, noting down which one was the anode and which was the cathode. Then what we did was we set up our circuit like this with the voltage on the power supply set to 6 volts. And it was something like this. So here is our copper anode and our copper cathode. And remember, we've already cleaned those and weighed them. 
Here is our copper sulfate solution as our electrolyte. But also in the circuit, we had an ammeter, which we were using to record the current. And we also had a variable resistor, which we can use to control the potential difference, which we can use to make sure we can then uh, adjust the current to the exact level that we want each time. So we switched on the power supply and we adjusted the variable resistor until the ammeter read 0.2 amps. Then what we did was we left the power on for 20 minutes to allow enough electrolysis to take place that we'll be able to take some reasonably accurate measurements at the end. Then what we did was we removed each electrode and we gently rinsed them with water. That would remove any of the solution that was still on the electrodes, but we did it gently because we don't want to knock any atoms off by mistake. And then what we did was we then dried them with propanone because what propanone does is it washes all the water away and then it evaporates really quickly. What we couldn't risk doing was we couldn't rub them dry because that might knock away loose atoms and mean that we don't get very accurate measurements. And lastly, once they were dry, we reweighed each electrode and recorded their mass. And then what we did was repeated all those previous steps with different currents. So we started off with a current of 0.2 amps, and then we did it with 0.3, 0.4, and 0.5 amps as well. So in terms of the results of the experiment, what we saw was two things. Firstly, we saw at the anode, there was a decrease in mass. And we saw that the greater the current was, the greater that decrease in mass. And then at the cathode, we saw that there was an increase in mass. And that the greater the current was, the greater the increase in mass. And really important, what we saw was that the cathode's mass increase closely matched the anode's decrease. They weren't exactly the same, but they were very, very close to each other. So pretty much all of the mass that was lost by the anode was then gained by the cathode. So why was that? What was happening? Well, at the anode, the decrease in mass is because copper atoms lose electrons to become copper ions in the solution. This is because the copper electrodes are not inert. They take part. And in that case, in this case, that's what's happening. So remember, with the, with the um, graphite electrodes, what was happening was that the oxidation we saw at the anode was hydroxide ions being discharged to form oxygen gas. But that's not what happens here. Instead, the oxidation that happens is copper atoms losing electrons to become copper ions floating around in the solution. So that's why the anode decreases in mass, because as the electrolysis continues further and further along, more and more atoms from the anode become uh, oxidized and form ions floating around in the solution. And equally, the cathode increased in mass because copper ions from the solution are discharged to form copper atoms on the cathode. And again, we can see that here. We see here a copper ion in the solution about to um, be reduced and form an atom on the cathode itself. And here we can see a couple of those atoms that have already um, joined onto our cathodes. So the cathode's increasing in mass because it's gaining atoms from the solution. And the anode is decreasing in mass because it's losing atoms to the solution. And finally, the greater the current, the more the electrons that can be transferred each second, meaning the more ions that can be discharged and the more atoms that can be turned into ions. So the last thing to look at is how we can use electrolysis to purify copper. And it works using the same method that we just saw in the core practical. So what we do is we carry out electrolysis using a small, pure copper cathode and a large, impure copper anode. And the electrolyte is aqueous copper sulphate. Now, we can see our pure cathode here containing only copper atoms. And we can see our impure anode here containing lots of copper atoms, but also these black atoms that represent various different impurities 
that might be present as well. Now, at the anode, what happens is that copper metal loses electrons. It gets oxidized to form aqueous copper ions and electrons. So atoms leave the anode and go into solution. You can see an example of that happening just there. Okay. And at the cathode, what happens is we get a reduction. So we see copper ions gaining electrons to form copper atoms, and they build up on the surface of the cathode. So over time, the anode gets smaller and the cathode gets bigger. But So this, this causes a transfer of copper atoms from the anode to the cathode. Now, really importantly, as more and more of the copper atoms get removed from the anode, eventually there's nothing holding each of our impurities in place. And as they lose the copper atoms that are attaching them to the anode, they just sink to the bottom as this sludge. So this is a really effective way to separate out our pure copper atoms that we want from the other impurities that we don't. And as an aside, those impurities often contain various valuable metals, things like silver that we might want. So that sludge is then processed to extract other useful metals from it, whilst also in helping us to purify the copper. Okay, so that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.